Well, uh, after listening to uh, Dan's uh, community meditation, you're going to get a heavy dose of John today. And uh, so we, we are on John in our, our walk through the, the Word. And, and the Gospels overall are all about God in public, God in, in the public sphere, uh, the kingdom of God uh, through the, the career and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, and he is the freedom bringing Messiah, the new Moses, uh, that he is the, the suffering servant, the divine uh, son of God, uh, that, that he is the, uh, the, the, a man of prayer and a man of compassion, uh, that, that, that he is here for everybody, that he is here for all people. And then John adds to that complex portrait. He adds his own strokes and his own hues to the, to the painting that the Gospels uh, present. He adds the, that he is the, the royal and divine creator God. And, and John, unlike the other authors, he, he bluntly tells us his purpose. He tells us the purpose of his book and of everything that he's written before that. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. All these signs, John calls all these, these signs, these miracles that Jesus provides to show who he is, so that we believe who he is, so that we believe and that we have life. And it all comes back to this of showing who he is and identifying who he is, displaying him as the royal creator. It is the underscore of what John does and by what he writes. And by, by looking at John, you get to know who God is by looking at Jesus. And John's book is highly organized. It's very organized. He had lots of time to write it. In fact, in class this morning, we mentioned that, that John had lots of time to remember and to reflect and to put together a cohesive, structured argument of saying, this is who Jesus is, and here are the proofs. He had 50 to 60 years at least, in most scholars' opinions, 50 to 60 years at least before he writes down this gospel after Jesus had, had died and been resurrected. And so he got lots of time. And even then, most scholars agree that, that John's own students, his own disciples, uh, put this together and edited this book based on what he had taught them. So this is, this is a structured book. This is an organized argument to show who Jesus is and has a purpose. And it, and it looks like this. It has a prologue, and that's what, what, what Dan read from in his communion. Can somebody turn me down a little bit back there? I can hear the ring. Yeah. Turn, turn my mic down a little bit. It can be broken down into, it's getting better. It can be broken down into, into four distinct sections. The prologue, the first 18 verses are, are very poetic and could have been an, an ancient Christian hymn, could have been used in that way. And without this prologue, we, we don't have the, the, the same type of Christian debates that go on when they're trying to define who exactly Jesus is. And in this, you learn this familiar concept, familiar to us, that Jesus is fully human and fully God. But without this prologue section, this, this debate doesn't go the same way early on when they're talking about Jesus. So this is a big deal uh, in, in John. The next section, the book of signs. This is what's called the book of signs. This is what includes his public ministry. For 12 chapters, you see Jesus performing miracles and, and disrupting the traditions and the, the teachings of the Pharisees. This is what happens uh, with, with the public eye on him, with the crowds. This is where we'll look at him. We'll look at this uh, in, in a moment, a little bit more detail. And then the book of glory. The, this third section was typically called the book of glory. This is where his passion ministry takes place. This is where the private, intimate moments happen with his disciples, the, the Passover meal, the foot washing, the, the private prayers, the prayer for unity is here, uh, his death, his resurrection, all taking place here in what's called the book of glory. His glory is seen through uh, his death and his resurrection, as we, we talked a little bit about this morning with, with, uh, with the book of Mark. And, of course, this, this last sign is his death and his resurrection. And, and it's seen through these intimate teachings, sort of seen through and interpreted through these intimate teachings. And that takes place some as well in the book of signs, where you have teachings paralleling with these, these miracles taking place. For example, the, the bread of life discourse and discussion and the, the loaves, the, all of the, the feeding of the multitudes going back to back, that he's uh, interpreting and seeing these things through the teachings of Jesus. 
Finally, the epilogue. And this is one of the things where people pointed that, that this is probably put in by one of his students. Somebody uh, added in this thing to tie up some loose ends and, and to uh, add testimony and proof to what John is saying. Here you get Peter being reconfirmed on the beach. Uh, and you get the, the miracle, the resurrection miracle of 153 fish. And so this sort of ties it all in together and, and brings it back uh, to full circle with, with the prologue. The Gospel of John is unique. And just like we saw last week with Luke, there's a lot of stories in Luke that were unique, and we looked at a few of them. John has uh, as much as 92% that is only in his gospel. Nowhere else do, 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 does he, uh, do we have some of these things. He doesn't rely on the parables the way some of the other gospels do. Uh, he does not mention Jesus uh, in Gethsemane. and He does not mention Jesus at his transfiguration. The events that are unique to him, the, the resurrection of Lazarus, water turning to wine, the discussion with Nicodemus, uh, the lengthy prayers, meaning the, the unity prayer. These are just some of the things that are unique to John's gospel. Jesus, not Jesus, John, loves multiple meanings. And that's seen throughout his gospel. He stresses the Holy Spirit. He stresses the alienation between Jesus and the Jewish leaders. He has, we talked about signs, the signs in the book of signs. He has seven signs to prove who Jesus is. He has seven statements, seven I am statements where Jesus will say, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the bread and the life. He has seven of those where he identifies who he is. John also has seven witnesses. People that will testify, beings that will testify, the Father, John the Baptist. He has seven of those witnesses. That, so he's very structured and organized in, in, in his argument for who Jesus is. John has themes throughout. He pits light against darkness. He pits life against life. Uh, the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of Satan. Pulling together opposites in, in, in showcasing the most opposite, fully God, fully man. As a fully God, fully man, the most opposite you can get. And that's central to his purpose. He, John knows that Jesus is fully human, but he's divine too. And, and that's what he wants people to see. That God is, this is the appearance of God into human history. In the flesh, God in the flesh. The creator reclaiming his world, reclaiming his creation. And he shows that. He shows that, uh, affirming the Jewish narratives. With the other Gospels, you have this Jewish narrative of, of God creating, and then the fall, and then Abraham, and then Moses, and then David, and all of it, all this narrative pointing to, to God creating and then redeeming his creation, doing something to, to fix it all. And John, along with the Gospels, portrays this, that Jesus is the one that, that, that starts this redemption process for everything. And he begins right there at creation. That's why Dan read the first part of this. We're going to look at it again a little bit. In the beginning was the Word. See, John goes all the way back to creation. Harkens back to God creating with the same words that Genesis uses. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Has not overcome it. The way John begins is, is vital. To understand, This is a big part of, of his gospel. He goes back to that beginning. The other gospels don't start this way. You see Matthew and you see Luke starting at the birth of Jesus, with, starting there with, with, with his birth as, as, a, as a baby in, in, in the flesh. And then you see with, uh, with, with uh, Mark beginning at Jesus' baptism, that that was a, a milestone in how he begins his public ministry, and we saw that. But John goes all the way back to time memorial. That Jesus was there at the beginning because he was God. Was God. He says he was God. Later down in the prologue, you'll see that he, he eventually names that, that, that God becomes flesh. And he names Jesus by name. And, and creation occurs here in the beginning. In the beginning, there was darkness. You go back and you look at the Genesis account. There's darkness. And then all of a sudden, there's light. And God creates the world. And so you've got this darkness and light, that Jesus, the, the light coming in to the moon. Without him, there is nothing. God, through his word, has created all things, the sun, the moon, the stars, the plants, the animals. Us creates it all. And Jesus is this word. Jesus is this word that creates the all-powerful divinity that gives life to everything. 
And so then the next 12 chapters of John's gospel lays out, here's some signs, here's some proof. We go back and look at that book of signs. Here's some proof, the evidence that he is the creator God that can create the world from the beginning of time. So we look at these a little bit. The first sign that he says is the water to wine. You know this, this miracle, right? He, he makes the wine for the, the wedding in Cana. But it's not just the chemical transformation that happens here. Do you remember the, the amazing thing about the wine? It was the best. Yeah, it was the best wine that he created. The, only the creator can make the, the, be the master of quality, the master of such quality, best quality wine. This is, this is for, for, for John pointing to who he is, right? It's the chemical transformation here, but man, it's the best stuff too. Doesn't make, doesn't make junk. The next one you see, the healed nobleman's son. The healed nobleman's son. And what's unique here is, is, is you see Jesus healing people in all of the Gospels. He heals blind people, lame people. He healed, raised people from the dead. He does this. So you think, well, why is John including these particular ones? Because he has... These seven, why is he pertaining these particular ones? I think it's because it goes to the point of him being God and being in control of all aspects of creation. Now, this particular one, he heals a noble myself. You remember what was unique about this one? He does it from a distance. Now, he does that as well in his other one, but, but John's point out, look, this guy is a master of space. He's the master of space, of distance. Nothing holds him back. Next one, he heals a lame man. He heals a lame man. And this is a unique one because he heals lame people as well. You've got the guy coming down through the roof that he heals in, in, in other Gospels. But this one, this guy's been waiting at the Pool of Bethesda for 38 years. He's been trying to get healed for 38 years. Only the Creator can be the master of such time, of chronology. He, 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 his time does not affect him one iota. He is, he was, and he will be master of time. He feeds the 5,000. Oh, and this has so many elements. You did, this is just, this miracle in itself and the discussion that goes with it is a whole lesson in itself. Feeding the 5,000. He's showcasing that he's the, the new manna from heaven. We talked a little bit about that in, 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 in class. That he is the manna from heaven. He's the bread of presence. He is the, the, the bread of life, the flesh that we celebrate and that we eat together when we take our communion. This is where this, this miracle points to. But it's also that he's the master of mathematical improbabilities, the master of quantities, that there, there's no number that's going to sustain him. There's no number that's going to restrain who he is. He can do anything, no matter what the improbability seems to say otherwise. Walks on water. He walks on water in the same chapter there. And you, you remember... Uh, he, he's, he's, he's in the flesh. He's fully human. And that's important to God. But he's still the creator. He's still the creator of all that he's seen. He's over the physics and he's over natural law. He is the master of all of creation. He heals the blind man. You remember, he's healed the blind man before. What's unique about this one in John where he heals the blind man? Well, it starts with a question. They say, well, who sinned? His parents? Or did he sin? You see, the creator knows each of his creations. Because he's the master of life's misfortune, and he's the master of genetics. And that's where you see this here. He is the creator, God, Jesus healing. Something that even they may not understand. Why is the guy blind? Well, you may not understand why, but I know who he is, and I know why. And I'm going to show because I'm going to heal him. And then the last one, resurrected Lazarus, the resurrection Lazarus. And this is only in the Gospel of John where he resurrects Lazarus, that he is the, the master of life and death. Only God can be the, be, be the master of life and death, that he has complete control over when life comes and when death <coughs> comes. And so this section, this book of signs, ends with the Jews rejecting him. And then people come running to Philip, Greeks, other people will come running to Philip saying, we, we want to see Jesus, please, can we see Jesus? And these signs showcase that he is over all creation, that he is the king who has come to inaugurate a new kingdom, the king and his new creation. Several times in chapters 18 through 19, you see this allusion to him being a king. He says, uh, Pilate explores the, the concept of him being a king. He insists at that, that title at the end of his death. Remember, he says, no, what I've written, I've written. He's the king of the Jews. Jesus himself will identify himself as a king. He'll say, well, my kingdom is not from this world. He is the king. But the king needs a kingdom. Every king needs a kingdom. And God, God is the creator God. 
If Jesus is the creator God, then it must start the same way that creation started. John started at the very beginning. And so look at the, the day one. As day one, creation unfolds. It unfolds in much the same way as the original creation. Okay? A few details of Jesus' passion and death. Jesus comes out wearing crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said, look, here is the man. The only place that you get that in, John, in the Gospel of John. When they saw him, the leading priests and temple guards began shouting, crucify him, crucify him. All right, this is on Friday. This is when this is happening. This is on day six, okay? Jewish calendar, day six. And we're looking at the creation, the original creation, and the new creation now, the new king, God creating again, creating anew. On day six, God in the flesh. Here is the man, right? That's what God creates on day six. He creates man, creates flesh. And here he is. The only time you see this, Pilate saying, here's the man, fully man, created for a purpose. In Genesis, God declares that his work is finished. He says it's done and it's good, right? You can see, look, in the end of Genesis 1 and the beginning of Genesis 2, it's all done, I've created, I'm finished. Well, here you have Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. And to fulfill scriptures, he said, I'm thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they soaked the sponge in it, put a hyssop branch, held it up to his lips. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and released his spirit. He knew what his mission was. He knew what he came to do. And he did it. And again, this is the only place you get this. Gospel of John, it is finished. That Jesus recording these words that Jesus says is a, a purpose. That creator God came to complete creation. On day six, he begins to redeem creation. Right? If you're looking at it from John's perspective, this is day six still. This is happening. At the end of day six, you have now redeemed creation. He says it's finished. It's done. I'm beginning the process of transitioning to this new kingdom. This new kingdom where grace and mercy and love will reign. And then, of course, on day seven, what happens? God rests. Creator God declared a day of rest. And as the old kingdom begins to transfer to the new kingdom, God rests. It was the day of preparation. The Jewish leaders didn't want the bodies hanging there the next day, which was the Sabbath. So the day of rest, the Sabbath. What happens? Because it was a day of preparation for the Jewish Passover, and since the tomb was close at hand, they put Jesus in the tomb. He's there resting. God in the flesh resting in the tomb on day seven. It was still dark. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb, found the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So the first day of the week is the new day, the first, the first day of the new kingdom. God raises up. Jesus raises up. And the most compelling sign of who he is and his new creation beginning to take place happens. God invades the world in order to redeem it. And we take part in that new kingdom. We take part in that new kingdom that he is God. He pours himself out as a sacrifice in the flesh to create a community of redeemed people, to create a community of redeemed people in a new creation. The creator, the king, wants us to work alongside of him. And you see this right after with Jesus in the resurrection stories. He says, the father has sent me, now I'm sending you. Creator God creates, son redeems, the Holy Spirit empowers with an ongoing mission. That's us. Part of the new creation, the redeemed, that we have a mission. And John's gospel declares this, declares that Jesus is the king and the creator and that we as his subjects have a mission, have a mission to go out and declare that he is that too to everyone around us. I'm going to end here with, a, with another video that's going to declare the completion of who Jesus is. The royal divinity of who he is and all the aspects that that encompasses it. And when we're, when we're done, we're just going to stand and sing and, and invite all of you to stand up and to declare praise to him all together with one voice. To praise our king and our savior. The Bible said my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know it. My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely 
sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's a centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the no way of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him?